All right, so the next item for our home automation setup is doing the buttons. So these will be input buttons that you push to turn on lights and things like that. And so we knew we wanted buttons and we knew approximately where we wanted them when we started the build, but we didn't know exactly how many and we didn't know exactly how they would work. So what I did is we ran some network cable and it's just literally cat six network cable that you would you know run on computers and these have eight little tiny wires in them and those would be just those will do just fine because for what we're doing it's just sending a very faint signal it's just carrying a little bit of voltage the problem is on the esp32 they have inputs and outputs and there's there's a whole bunch there's maybe 18 or 19 20 different gpio pins that we could use and those are general purpose they can be inputs or outputs and there's different ways you can configure them and on most of them they have a built-in pull down or pull pull up resistor. And so that's really important because when there isn't a signal on the wire, in other words, when it's not being pressed, we don't want random interference to go through and make it look like someone's pressing the button. And that is a real issue. I actually hooked some of this up at home and tried it. And sure enough, it was detecting button presses when there wasn't any. To solve that, what you need is either a pull down resistor, if you're going to use positive 3.3 volts to say that hey I'm on or a pull up resistor if you're going to use ground to say that the switch is triggered that's a little bit technical but in essence what needs to happen is you need pull down resistors like I said most of the pins have them unfortunately four of the pins that we need to use don't have them it's in the spec it's in like the the little thing you download that tells you what does what. The last four pins GPIOs 36, 39, 34, and 35 don't have pull up or pull down resistors and so you have to do that on an external circuit and so we've done that this is what it would look like actually i'm going to have these come up and cover the resistor and the wire just so there's no risk at all of interference between the pins but this is what it looks like essentially this is a ground pin here and then it goes through these resistors and so what it does is when you plug this in to those pins that are there it looks like it's ground so it looks like a zero signal so then what these wires that are coming off of it do there'll be another wire that feeds three volts and so when you close the switch and you make that connection it'll show high on you know whatever button you push so if it shows high then it will be like a signal like hey it's on so we have we've also written special code that if you keep it pressed it will dim the lights until they're the lowest and then bring them back up that's kind of a subject for another time but that's the way we're using them and so this is the the sort of the problem we had to overcome so this is created with the wrong resistors because i was just doing this as a test just to see if i could to see if i could get a little bit of in, in that tight of a space and it looks like they worked out okay so i'm gonna go ahead and do this for real with using 10k resistors on this so i've read a bunch of stuff on the internet and people say use anywhere from 2k to 10k with the overwhelming majority using 10k so i'm gonna use 10k we'll see if there's a problem we'll test it out obviously before we make anything final but this is what we're doing today this is the final configuration we ended up with for our button panels we have four panels all together one in the entry one in the kitchen one in the bathroom and one in the kids bedroom the entry has three buttons the kitchen has four buttons and the kids and the bathroom each have two buttons this column shows the gpio pins we intend to use for the inputs on the esp boards and the last column shows the wires and the colors that they are in the ethernet cable that we intend to use with these circuits
two, three, four, five, six. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we've gone ahead and soldered these wires in. So this is for the kitchen wall plate and it contains four switches. So we have the four wires here. In order for those switches to work, they need a plus 3.3 volts. And so that will come in through the orange wire. So we'll do that a little bit later. And it will also just get snapped into one of these little connectors. We also have other cables here because we have four wall plates that we're dealing with. And so they each have one of these network cables going to them. But for these, there is already a pull down resistor built into the processor that we can just call. So we're gonna go ahead and leverage that. So these should just be a crimp on ordeal that we just kind of plug into the back. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Okay. And then dark stripes is next. And then Light solid is next. Okay. And these are all in a row. Mm hmm Light solid. Okay. All right, so uh, this okay, is let's unplug everything. just this. Yeah, the two are out. This one, I'm going to take this out, I think, right? And then yep. this goes on the very end. Right? Uh, yeah. This is going in here. So now we just have to zip tie. All right, so I think we're completely wired in here. We've wired in all of the inputs into the back of the ESPs. And so the next step is to put together those plates and to wire those up. Next up, we're installing these buttons. So we've made these little aluminum plates with just these momentary push buttons. And you can see how they're wired in the back. That's because these have a common positive. So they run 3.3 volts in through here. And when you push the button, 3.3 volts goes out of here into a network cable, which we have in here. We'll wire these up to here and that'll send a signal to the front, which for this one, will turn on these bathroom lights and then the other one will turn on the shower. Technically, they could control anything. So it's just an input pin on our home automation setup. And if we don't like the way that works, we can change it. And the cool thing is, if let's say it's late at night, let's say it's past 10 o'clock or something, and someone's coming in to go to the bathroom, and they push this button, it could just bring up the lights at like 20%. So it's not this big bright light that comes on. It's just a really, like almost like a night light in here. It should be fun.
right, so we've mounted the switch panels up front. We've mounted them in the kids' bedroom, and we've also mounted them in the bathroom. So our last set of switches is for the kitchen area, and we wanted it to go on this wall. So the problem we had is this wall is also our pocket door. So the pocket door slides in behind there, and so we don't really have access to run wires and things behind this wall. This wall is also, we wanted it to be strong because the cabinets are kind of attached to it, so we didn't want to channel out anything into this wall. So when we originally designed this, we said, you know what, we'll just do planks, sort of the same as the rest of the walls, and then on the plank that comes across that is the closest, we'll go ahead and channel the back of that and run the wire in there, and then we'll put the switch plate right here where it feels natural to have a switch plate. The problem with that is that when we installed our kitchen cabinets, we totally forgot that we were gonna do that. And in order to do that, we would need a spacer. So we would need a spacer here, but we didn't do that, so now, now these drawers are basically flush with this wall so plan B time we're very used to plan B's so it was fine so what we've decided to do at this point was make this hanging rack we'll go ahead and attach this here and the switches you see we have a place here for the switches and on the back of this now we've routed a channel for that wire to run and so this is the switch plate here and it will fit right in there and should look you know something like that so anyway that's the way we're going to run those and uh, we're going to get started on that All right, so this is how the plate turned out. We attached it with just some simple stainless screws and ran the wire behind and then up and we got these little cable runs off Amazon, uh, which do a great job of just making it sort of disappear inside the cabinet. But we were pretty happy with the way it turned out. All right, so this is now a year later and I'm finally getting around to finishing this video. So after we'd wired all these lights up, we'd gotten everything tested and working, and I did have the program in there that just turned the lights that I wanted on full bright. It didn't do any of the home automation stuff. It didn't do anything other than come on and turn the lights on full bright. I did write a couple other auxiliary programs that would just test the switches to make sure that everything was wired correctly and working as we thought it would. And of course I tested all that stuff, but we were in a hurry to finish the bus and this became a relatively low priority. So we lived with just having the lights on full bright uh, anytime we plugged in the little fuse for about six months. And so we would just use the little fuse block like an on off switch. So there it turns all the lights off. And then what we would do to turn lights on is use these emergency buttons. And that is because at night, we still wanted light out here or in the bathroom when we're showering, but we didn't want the kids to have light in the bedroom because they were trying to fall asleep. We would use these to turn on lights. And of course, these only turn on a few of the lights, which I'll show you. So when I turn these switches on, here I'll turn them off. So this is uh, the living room. We'll just turn on a few of the living room lights. The kitchen just turns on a few of the kitchen lights. And these, of course, when we design them, it's designed for an emergency use where nothing is working. We don't have, maybe one of our ESPs went bad, maybe one of the boards went bad. These are backup manual switches. And so this is how they work. And so we can see that it turns the lights on all the way back. So when it was time for kids to go to bed, we would just turn the lights off in the bedroom and in the bathroom. And now we still have light up here and it's not as bright but it's nighttime and it just really didn't bother us. So this is the way we ran it for six months because 
that basically filled what we needed and we were extremely busy trying to get things finished and done and then we were traveling and so there was a million other things that took precedence over this but I finally got some time carved out and was able to finish so I got home assistant loaded on an Ubuntu image before I when I was testing it I had tested on a standalone Raspberry Pi which was fine and I could have actually used that here, but it was just causing all kinds of issues. So I wanted to get it on a system where I could back it up. I could back up the VM image and things like that. And so I wanted it to be on a virtual machine because I already had a server in here that was doing other things. Um, we run a file server off it and things like that. And so once I got that set up, then I moved into going ahead to do the home automation stuff through the buttons. So the issue with getting the home automation stuff is when I first started doing it and I first discovered MQTT and Home Assistant and all that, I did all of this stuff manually. And so I manually opened sockets and manually listened for MQTT messages and manually broadcasted MQTT messages, which is fine. And it gives you a very fine grain control the problem is it takes a whole lot of code. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of lines to do the most rudimentary things. And so I had even programmed things where when you hold the button down, um, the lights would go to full bright and then it would come back down to min bright and then, you know, go back and forth until you let go and then it would stay and remember that setting. And I thought those kinds of things would be harder to do in a framework. I thought I needed all the control of the programming because when I push the button, there's actually four zones in this area that I want illuminated. And so I thought, man, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that with one of these packaged frameworks. Boy, I was wrong. <laughs> So I talked with Scott Cook, who owns a 4106 like I do, and he said, man, you should really be using ESP Home. And so that got me curious. I got to looking at it. So one of the other issues was every time I uploaded code, I would need to plug in the, the wire and bring my laptop in up here, and it, and it was a huge pain. And ESP Home offers being able to do that over wirelessly over the network, which is a beautiful thing once you've started using it. So I did start looking into ESP Home and lo and behold, I could do all the custom programming that I want. Now it isn't in C, like the way I wrote it before, but it's, you know, they have a pseudo language that gets compiled into the, the native language and it works beautifully. So I was able to do basically all the things I wanted in literally a fraction of the time. In fact, once I committed to doing ESP Home and getting ESP Home onto the processor, it's awesome. You just modify the code in their little editor, hit push, and it'll push it over the air and do the update all automatically. It's really great. There's also, keeping with our de uh, graceful degradation concepts, it actually, when it doesn't detect that it can find the server, which happens from time to time, what it does is sets up its own little network, which you can join in a little web interface. So it's actually a very, it tied in very well with the concepts that I wanted for our home automation system. All right, so enough talking about the technical part. How does it actually work? So we've got our buttons back here. And if we just press the button, we can see the lights can turn on and off. So we've got just on and off functionality there. There's an under cabinet here. But if I press and hold, it will dim down the lights so we can use these also as dimmers. So if I press and hold, it will go the other way um, and it'll rise back up until it's full bright and then stop. So we can dim them from the buttons or from any device that basically has a web browser. All right, in addition to controlling it with our buttons, Home Assistant also has an app and you can actually also get to it from a web interface but this will allow us to control all our zones independently. So we can see here we're presented with a series of switches which we can then use to control each zone independently. So if we wanted to just turn off the driver side uh, portion of the kitchen lights, we would just click that button and they would turn off. Now, if we go into that button by pressing it, we're presented with a slider where we could dim those lights uh, independently of every other zone. So we just slide that up and we can see that, that it uh, does the dimming. Another thing that we found very useful is the grouping. So right now all the lights are grouped together. So with one switch, we can just hit the master switch and it will turn off all of the lights all at once.
So uh, we use that often at night just to make sure everything is off and you know while we're lying in bed. And so if we click that back on, it will actually bring all the lights on and remember all of their states. So if we had some that were dimmed before, they would come on and be dimmed at the same level as when we turned it off. All right, so after all of that, how is this better than just having a normal light switch? And just to be clear, having a normal light switch is fine, but this offers us quite a few things. On a practical level, when we get ready for bed and there's lights on, we just pick up our phones and hit a button and all of the lights turn off. It also allows for monitoring and tells us when lights are on and off. And so we'll know how much power we can extrapolate, how much power we're using and things like that. Also, another example is the other night we went to go see the lighting of Mount Rushmore, which it's summer, so that doesn't happen until very late. And we're boondocking, by the way. So we didn't get back to the bus until probably 1030 at night, and it is pitch black out here. So as we're pulling up, we can actually just turn the, the bus lights all on, and it was much safer for us to come into the bus and get inside rather than having to fish around for are the lights on and things like that. We could clearly see everything outside. It also just future proofs everything and will allow us to do things like scenes. And so what scenes allow you to do is have things in a certain configuration. So if we find that when we get up, we just like the up lights on and everything else very dim, then we can say, set that up as a scene that says, hey, good morning. And the good morning scene is turn all the up lights on and dim all the overhead lights. Now, if we're working on something or reading, we want that overhead light. And so we could say, hey, another scene is reading mode in which we turn off the up lights and just the down lights are on full bright. So those are two very rudimentary examples. Another one would be if it's late at night and we push the button, maybe the lights only come on to like 30%. So it's like almost like a night light. So you don't get this big bright light and you don't have to remember to like hold the dim. Just anytime you access lights and it's after 10 p.m., then um, it will do that functionality. So there's a ton of other examples. Uh, these are just a few that I can think of just off the top of my head. All right, so after a year with this system, we are very happy with it. So we've been down some crazy bumpy roads, some dirt roads and back roads, and we've put about 18,000 miles on the bus and we haven't had a single issue with any of the lighting stuff. We've also added to the home automation stuff. We've added fans and temperature sensors. We have one in the freezer and in the tech cabinet to tell us What's going on? We also have a temperature sensor in the bay, and we've even added a leveling system for the bus to the home automation system. So the system has proven to be very versatile and very configurable. We've also added stuff from our solar and Victron equipment, all speak, uh, kind of an open format. And so we've started bringing that stuff in. So overall, the system has been great, and this is how we implemented ours.